Hi, I'm Jewel Bats. So nice to see you. Today I am going to be discussing the 2017 independent horror movie Temple. I will be reviewing it based on its premise, its production value and artistic choices, and finally how it stands apart from or blends into other films of the genre. I hope you enjoy. The story unfolds at a mysterious, unnamed facility in Japan where two Japanese men are questioning a disfigured, kind of shrouded from view American man. They're saying, hey, you know, do you know what happened to you? Do you know where you are? Do you know what your name is? Do you know this girl? And they show a video of this girl. The man seems to recognize her. He goes, where did you get that? Blah, blah, blah. And we are kind of taken back about a week to this man's memories. He is Chris. He's friends with this girl named Kate. Kate has a boyfriend named James. They are all going to Japan uh, for various reasons. Chris has been interested in Japanese culture since he was young. Um, he knows a fair amount about it as much as someone who just studies for fun can, and he can speak a little bit of Japanese, so the other two kind of invited him to be their interpreter. Kate is his friend, she's been his friend for a long time, she's dating James, and she's doing a thesis on religion of some kind, and so she wants to go and take photographs of different shrines and temples in the Japanese rural areas to use in her thesis presentation. And I'm not sure what James's deal is, he kind of seems like a trust fund baby, so he might just be there for vacation. Trust fund babies. James is having a little bit of tension with Chris because he thinks Chris likes Kate, whereas Chris feels a little bit like a third wheel because Kate and James are always smooching and stuff, but they still manage to have a pretty good time. While visiting a small shop, Chris and Kate find a little journal that describes this temple with a kitsune guarding it. They go to purchase this book. The lady at the counter goes, oh, where did you get this? It's not for sale. Please leave. We're closed. Um, the other two think that Chris has perhaps offended her by saying the wrong word or something, which, you know, that's a very real possibility. But he's like, no, no, I didn't. Later on, while Kate and James are smooching or whatever they're doing, Chris kind of goes out for a walk. He finds himself at the shop again, and he turns around and sees this little boy in the shop. And he says, oh, little boy, like, are there any grown-ups here? And the little boy just goes, I'm a grown-up. I'm nine. What can I do for you? <laughs> and uh, Basically, the little boy ends up selling Chris this book that the woman would not sell them earlier. The three journey on to this temple, and every place that they go, they're like, hey, do you know how to get to this temple with the kitsune guarding it? And everyone is like, you don't want to go there. That temple will make you sick. Or don't go there. There's a lot of creepy stuff. Children go missing there. Or like, don't go there. Um, there's like a, a, an abandoned mine shaft and people get lost. Like, don't go in there. Just, just stay away. But they go anyway. They eventually come to a small village, like pretty close by actually. They stop to spend the night and Chris meets the little boy Seta again. And Seta's like, yeah, I live here. Hey, I know that temple. Like, you know, I can lead you. I have to be back before dark because my mom does not like me playing around there, but I used to go there, so I know how to get there if you guys want me to take you. And he's super cute. And the guys are like, yeah, let's, let's all go. So all three of them follow this little boy up to this temple. But as they're following him up to the temple and learning more and more lore about this temple, questions arise. So why is this temple so shrouded in mystery? What actually happened at this temple? Why is everyone so, so concerned with not letting these people go to this temple. And why does every single person say, you can't be there after dark? You'll have to find out by watching the movie or the rest of this review. This movie is only about an hour and 18 minutes long. It flowed along in not the fastest pace I've ever seen, but kind of more a sumptuous and rich pace. It really seemed like the movie, it wasn't rushing itself, and it didn't have to because it was so short. Um, I think if the movie had been like an hour and a half or something, people might have started to get annoyed watching it, but I thought that every choice pacing-wise seemed very deliberate, and um, I appreciated it, and I, I got very enveloped in the story. The film started a little bit typically, but it quickly became its own unique story. Um, 
very quickly. The movie was generally fairly quiet. Um, there wasn't a lot of background noise um, because they weren't in the city. They were in rural Japan, so I, I thought that was fitting. And despite a lot of the characters speaking in kind of a low tone of voice, they were all very uh, intelligible and easy to understand. A huge percentage of the movie is in Japanese because they are in Japan. So there are subtitles for that, but I had subtitles on the whole time because I was eating food and I needed to hear over my chewing. But that said, it was very easy to understand. The music was very understated. It didn't really pop out as being too much either way. The color scheme of this movie kind of skewed towards being cool and kind of like digital you know, like, like kind of like bluish and like grayish kind of colors. I thought it was all right because it wasn't too overdone, but a lot of digitally shot films have that kind of color skewing lately. And this is a modern film, so I guess it makes sense, but that was kind of just a trend that I've noticed and it was in this movie. The journey that this movie took us on involved a lot of varied camera shots from, you know, up close to like really far away. And I thought that made for a really interesting visual watching. I didn't get bored visually with it. They were not afraid to go dark with it as far as the color tones. And I noticed that the blacks were very black, which is not as common in digital films today. And I really liked that. The film was not afraid to use shadows and kind of like things off to the side as a lot of part of the film's framing and visual storytelling. The special effects for the most part were very, they kind of very much kept you wondering. Um, they were kind of, like I said, a lot of like off to the side stuff. As the movie went on, towards the end, there was some CGI usage that I did not think was up to par. Um, and I, it kind of pulled me out of the movie a little bit, but for the most part, the movie used generally not too much CGI up until like the very end. So do with that what you will, do with that what you will. Now I am going to discuss how this movie stands apart from or blends into other films, TV shows, etc. of the genre. I will be spoiling this movie, so if you don't want spoilers, get out there and watch that movie. Um, leave now. You've been warned. I'll give you two seconds to leave if you're gonna leave. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. So the myths surrounding the temple that people have kind of been alluding to but not really giving the full story of is that some children went missing the day that this old mine shaft closed. This old mine, mine shaft, Minecraft closed. And so when the people were out looking for their children who didn't come home when it was dark like they normally do, they found a wandering monk setting up camp in this old temple guarded by the Kitsune statue. When they questioned him, he claimed he didn't know anything about the children, but the people were not satisfied with his answer and Presumably, they dealt with him in a very harsh way. And every year, people light candles and pray that the children will find their way home. The little boy, Seta, had led them up there, but he says, it's getting dark, you should leave, you know. And they said, Seta, can you find your way home without us? And he goes, yeah, and just like, he's like, I'm gone. So these three Americans are up at this temple and they're trying to leave before it gets dark, but all of a sudden, while Chris is in the temple, it feels like a hand grabs him and yanks him through the floorboards. He falls, the others run, he's knocked out and his leg is broken and he can't go down the mountain. So they have to camp at this temple in the dark. Some of the emotional tension between Kate and James kind of bubbles. He thinks she's cheating on him a little bit with Chris and he kind of leaves in a huff because of something Kate reveals about her personal life. and. She's really upset and he's like, you know what, like, I'll leave you guys with my food and water, but I am going back, I'll send help in the morning, bye. And he like stomps off. He walks around in a big circle and suddenly the Kitsune statue that he had seen before is not there. And something is hunting him, presumably the Kitsune. Kate hears James yelling, she goes to find him and accidentally ends up somehow in this mine shaft but she gets trapped in there and can't get out and is kind of running around in the dark trying to get find her way out and all the exits seem to be sealed. Chris is left alone in this temple and all of a sudden all these children with no eyes start crawling out of this hole that he'd fallen through in the floor and they start attacking him and he's screaming and trying to get them off of him. Cut back to the interview room 
They say that there's evidence that Chris killed them both. And he's like, no, no, I didn't. No, no, I didn't. No. And they're like, well, you have a history of, of psychotic issues. So we think you did it. And he says, no, the little boy, Seta, he's out in the hallway right now. And you pan to the hallway and there's this ghost boy of Seta in the hallway. So what really happened? This movie is kind of similar to a lot of movies, I think, where people who are not familiar with an area come in and are terrorized by things that are going on, like the Wicker Man or the Children of the Corn. Those aren't even like foreign people, they're just like, I'm a city person coming to the country. But you know what I mean, it's a very common idea. Um, one movie that's kind of similar as well it features an American couple who moved to Colombia because the wife's father owns a big factory there and a bunch of children have gone missing. People think it's the ghosts of formerly killed children who'd been killed by conquistadors and they kidnap her daughter and she has to find them. So the whole concept of like foreigners being out of their element and like terrorizing and or being terrorized is definitely not a unique one. A lot of people of a certain age who had exposure to certain media know a fair amount about certain types of Japanese culture here in America. And I think if you're one of those people, um, you'll find it kind of interesting to follow along and just like watch what's going on. Um, it doesn't feel like this movie was like voyeuristically exploiting like the Japanese countryside in, by any means. Um, a lot of the things that they showed were very, very subtle and you know, they didn't try to be like, oh, well, I'm an American and this is what a kitsune is. To me, it seemed very subtle and just fairly respectful. And I've seen a lot of really, really clumsy movies where Americans bunk up the culture. I really didn't get that vibe from this. So I thought it did stand out quite a bit. And it was just a really fun journey because you do see them go from like their airport or whatever, traveling down through the countryside up to the temple. And because you got to see a lot of the scenery and meet different people, it really did feel like a journey. Other movies, it tends to be like, oh, I'm a foreigner and I just moved here and here I am now, blank. It's like, this is like, no, they're just passing through and they kind of kept that vibe. If I had to rate this movie, I would give it a three out of five stars. I really enjoyed this movie. It was so much fun to watch and it really felt like you were on a journey and it felt very like suspenseful rather than like overtly like gory horror. But that said, the movie didn't actually make a lot of sense. The conclusion didn't wrap up anything for me and it was really unclear what had actually happened, whether there was actually a spooky thing or whether Chris had killed them all himself. It was, it was not clear to me, it was not clear. Maybe it was supposed to be a combination. Maybe as the audience, I am supposed to conclude for myself and it's supposed to be mysterious, but it just wasn't a satisfying conclusion, I guess, for me as a viewer. And there were a lot of things going on in this movie, a lot of elements, and they didn't quite all line up. At the beginning of the movie, one of the people says that Chris has had some kind of shoe, which does come in later, but so you've got that, you've got the romantic tension, you've got the children who go missing, you've got the temple and the mine shaft, you've got the kitsune, you've got this monk that kind of doesn't come back into play anywhere, really. Um, there's this guy, Hitoshi, that they talk about. Hitoshi has gone up to the temple and he came back holding his eyes and his hands like oranges. Like that never really comes back into play when they're up there and little Seta has uh, led them up to this temple. Chris finds this bell, like this long-handled bell in the dirt and he kind of like rings it and you're like, oh my gosh, what is this bell gonna mean? And the bell never comes back. The bell never comes back. He literally goes, what did I find? And the camera like focuses on the bell. So you're like, surely surely this has to be in the movie somewhere it's not and you're like what and because it was really unclear like were the children killed by the monk or was the monk just a ghost because the townspeople killed him like i don't know is the kitsune real kitsune real like i don't know it just really wasn't conclusive in that way and so that was disappointing and I just honestly don't feel like I can give the movie a higher score because of those elements not completely lining up. Also, I'm not an expert on kitsunes or Japanese folklore by any means, but the way the CGI depicted the kitsune is not how I've typically seen kitsunes depicted, so I'm not sure if I just am dumb and don't know anything or if they took a lot of liberties with that when they designed 
their version of the kitsune, but that kind of stuck out to me as a little bit weird. So that's why I give it a three out of five stars. Altogether, this was a great movie to watch and just kill an hour and 18 minutes with. Don't get your expectations too high, but it is a great one to just have fun with. And I really enjoyed going on this journey with these three people. I would love to hear what you guys have to say. If you have seen this movie, what are your thoughts? Did you like how the tourists interacted with the people and how the rural Japan countryside was depicted? Or did you think it was cliche? If you know anything about kitsunes, what did you think about how the kitsune was visually depicted? I would really like to know anybody who knows anything about that. Please let me know anything you have to say. Um, thank you so much for watching. I hope that this review was enjoyable to you and hopefully helpful to you. Please like this video if you liked it and please consider subscribing. Uh, I don't know if I've said this, but I review horror movies. Um, so if you like horror movie reviews and you like me, please consider subscribing. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye.